By the year 2020, the video game industry is expected to grow to a value of 90 billion dollars, which, to those uninformed, is roughly enough to buy every man, woman and child on Earth two and a half Big Macs. Seven publishers own 64% of the software market, and three companies own 88% of the global hardware market. It's an industry where giant companies keep a tight stranglehold on the entire economy also known as an oligopoly or dystopian cyberpunk prequel with shitty bad guy logos. This has already happened in most other industries, but this is the important one, dammit! But Ula, doesn't the market make sure we get the best games possible? Well, it's not really that simple, is it? What is a good game anyway? I thought Spec Ops The Line was great, although it still haunts my nightmares and gave me PTSD. And Anthem would probably be a great game if it weren't for the fact that it's the same damn game we've been playing since Halo Combat Evolved. AAA games haven't gotten worse as much as they've gotten streamlined into a kind of game that I think is shit. Larger companies have to answer to shareholders before they answer to fans, and they only care about one thing. MONEY! It's not really them or the developer's fault that they have this giant pressure on them. It's a lot easier to experiment and try new things when you're a tiny startup with $4,000 rather than a behemoth series with 40 million who has to sell well or the goddamn universe will end. They basically have to walk this horrible tightrope where they can't make something so ambitious that people won't like it but also not so safe that it's too boring. Now, I sure do wonder whether this makes a market where we get creative development. Oh wow, a fucking battle royale! Yeah, that'll fix it! Thanks, Howard! Now, I'm not saying miracles don't happen. Sometimes you run out of shit to copy-paste, so you use Polish magic and questionable working conditions. Or earn more money than several countries, so you can afford to try something a little weird once in a while. But how did it get like this? It's time for... About in 1976, the Austrian economist Josef Schumpeter coined the term creative destruction, based from Marx's theories on the innovation war, which simply put means capitalist industry is in a constant struggle to create new products and services, and so also destroy the value of those that already exist. We see this attitude in how the greatest companies project infinite growth, despite the fact that that just isn't possible. Which is why the CEO of Activision Blizzard can say, While our financial results of 2018 were the best in our history, we didn't realize our full potential. And then turn around and fire 775 workers. That's right, despite the fact they earned more money than ever before, they still wouldn't let go of a goddamn projection. Which basically is just a made up number of how much money they think they should earn. Then they take the money they are missing from hardworking employees instead. Infinite growth also means you can never let anything profitable die. Kill me. A little louder. Kill me! You're no good to me, dead. We need you. Which is why we have eight Spider-Man films. This time we even more Spider-Man. Another fifty Spider-Man, a trillion spider eyes. We may be spiders, but we're dropping light. light. Creative destruction forces you to make the same thing over, but bigger, bolder, and to a bigger audience. The philosopher Bernie Sanders questions when creative destruction turns into destructive destruction. When and how does the work of introducing technological innovation tend to form a less creative and a more toxic and damaging alteration of society and culture? His conclusion is basically that it destroys society's collective goals and values and limits people's ability to reflect over and creatively adopt technological innovation into their own social existence. I'll explain what he means by this in a little bit. Whoa! Hold on there, Ulla! That seems a bit harsh. What about creative new games, like Horizon Zero Dawn? Art is basically a reflection of the people making it, and studies show that the games industry usually consists of exploiting passionate artists who make games for its own sake, and not for money. Even in the indie scene, studies show that when monetary gain is mentioned, they usually express the want for enough to be financially secure, and not super billionaires. In large companies, 
they are too demotivated to use their full creative potential. Instead, they take solace in being creative within the very narrow borders what projections say they will earn the most money, and is the easiest to market. Ergin Bulut, hope I said that right, wrote an article where he described this process as one-dimensional creativity and explained how it's basically the driving force behind AAA game development, based on what philosopher and sociologist Herbert Marcuse called the one-dimensional man. Basically, someone bound by consumer society, where we have the freedom to choose, but nothing makes us happy because infinite growth will keep supplying the same thing but slightly different instead of actually innovating. In practice, this means that one-dimensional creativity evolves gaming by upgrading and adding what is already profitable. That means hardware, graphics, interactivity and speed. Bigger, better, faster. This is basically what our boy Bernard Stiegler thought was degrading culture and society. We see the opposite in communities, not in it just for the money. Like indie developers and modders. There, innovation, creativity and experimenting are the focus. Also, Horizon Zero Dawn is obviously just Far Cry but made by the Wachowskis. There's also another side to gaming today that's pretty damn apocalyptic. Have you ever played Words with Friends? Did you know it was made by LITERALLY SATAN? When I first wrote that I took it away for being too much. But then I went to their website and saw they made a Snapchat Battle Royale. <coughs> Zynga Incorporated is probably the reason your uncle on welfare has to move into a smaller apartment and isn't allowed the password to the Apple ID anymore. Zynga have themselves stated that they started out analyzing data, then they figured out the best way to extract data from users was to make games. Then they could analyze that data to figure out how to make people use real money for virtual goods. And now your uncle's car is gone, God damn it! I told you not to tell him the password. Scholars are attempting to understand and prevent online gaming addiction. Whereas marketers and game developers are attempting to design financially lucrative features that will immerse users within the game and make them spend more money. These bastards are sitting around not trying to make good games, but rather make addictive games. And holy shit does it work! Today the mobile games industry is larger than the console industry. The console industry saw that they could also use the same tricks, and that's why now we're stuck with fucking freemium games and loot boxes everywhere. So to summarize, as Maslow's law of the instrument states, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if you're a AAA game studio, every franchise looks like a looter shooter with loot boxes and a battle royale mode. Is there any way to fix this? To change the cult of endless financial growth and make a space where creative people can fulfill their potential? I see only one way. Drinking Heineken. Then when we're properly drunk, we end capitalism once and for all. If every single one of us buys 9 copies of Dead Cells from the Democratic Worker Co-op Motion Twin, they will grow ENORMOUS and smash the weak glass towers of the filthy corporations. It will inspire workers in other industries to seize the initiative and create new, better industries which creates wealth for the people and not shareholders. The laws written by bot politicians which prevent the betterment of humankind will no longer apply. For together, we are the law, and our law shall account for everyone. Hurra! But if that doesn't work, there's still hope in the industry. Crowdfunding, Twitch, and the release of game engines to the public have created a powerful indie scene that hopefully keep making weird, cool, and creative stuff for a long time. I could also go into how streaming games and VR could change everything I just talked about. Write a comment if you think I should check that out next time. But now I have to go a look at the reboot of the remade fourth game of a series that I played as a kid. Thank you very much for taking the time to check out my weird ramblings and slap that subscribe button if you'd like to see more.